I wanted to see myself with scientists from our department, what we can do as a government to bring absolutely every protection to bear in order to ensure that every measure possible is being undertaken to protect uh, this endangered species. A deadly summer for right whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We begin here and now tonight with a mystery. Scientists are trying to figure out why 10 endangered right whales have died. In the last week, some of these whales have washed up on the shores of Newfoundland. While today you heard the DFO minister there, Dominic LeBlanc, calling it a crisis and a risk to global reputation. The CBC's Ter Tony, sorry, Tori Weldon has more. Dominic LeBlanc took to the podium fresh from a helicopter ride to see the right whales for himself. Uh, it was an absolutely majestic sight. But aside from the whale's extraordinary beauty, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans says the current situation is also an extraordinary challenge. Since June, at least 10 dead North Atlantic right whales have been found in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Some showed signs of being hit by ships. At least one was found entangled in snow crab fishing gear. In July, the snow crab fishery was closed early in northern New Brunswick. And LeBlanc says ships are now being asked to slow down in areas where right whales are spotted. It's a scientific challenge, it's a conservation challenge because of the particular species that everybody wants to protect and, and sh has to protect and should protect. LeBlanc will meet with marine and fishing industries to see what more can be done to protect the whales, but not before a full study of the dead whales can be completed, something scientist Matthew Hardy says will take time. It's a massive undertaking. One, one necropsy alone is a huge endeavor. Uh, six is, is even, even more so. A full report with a list of possible steps will be made public by mid-September. And LeBlanc made clear, Canada can't afford not to take the problem seriously. If a country doesn't take its responsibilities, then one of the potential remedies uh, is uh, a restriction into the U.S. market. So Canada is and will take every possible measure to ensure that we're doing what the world expects of us and what Canadians expect of us to protect these species. Scientists have limited time to study the whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They're expected to migrate out of the area by Thanksgiving. Tori Weldon, CBC News, Moncton. As you heard in the story there, ships colliding with whales is being blamed for some of the deaths. Officials have asked ships to reduce their speed to reduce the chances of colliding with the whales. Now OceanX has ships traveling through the Gulf delivering freight to Newfoundland. But the head of the company told me today that it's not practical to slow down to 10 knots. Uh, if we were to do that, that's half speed, which is double the time, and a seven-day service would become something much longer. So uh, the impacts would be huge financially as well directly, uh, you know, because time is money. And if you can do a crossing in uh, 60 hours and it takes you 100 hours, it's going to be significantly different. We're going to be following the story on Here and Now tonight. Find out more about what scientists have found and we'll hear more from OceanX about some of the things that the company is doing to try and prevent collisions. Well, in the weather department, some gorgeous weather on the way for tomorrow and Saturday. Warm temperatures and sunshine on the menu for most. All the details coming up. Preventing a deadly parasite. Birdman Bill Montevecchi on why your backyard feeder is hurting, not helping. More money. It's good news for early childhood educators. And when TV takes a turn on one of Here and Now's reporters on harassment while taping in the field. While well, plans are underway for renovations at the Health Sciences Centre in St. John's to help provide help for people with eating disorders. The $700,000 facility is part of the province's Mental Health and Addictions Action Plan and will house a four-bed intensive care unit. A support team of psychiatric nurse, a psychologist, dietitian and social worker will all also be hired. The tender for the construction will be out later this month. Vince Withers lost his daughter to an eating disorder. He's also head of the Eating Disorder Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador and he's with us live. Mr. Withers, just what will this unit mean for those dealing with eating disorders in this province? Uh, Peter, uh, there's been a significant uh, improvement in treatment and support services 
for eating disorder families over the past several years. However, there's a big gap, and that gap is, of course, the lack of an intensive care inpatient program. Uh, presently, we have a very successful outpatient program, but many of our eating disorder uh, children, I say children, adolescents, are, are seriously ill and require an intensive care program. Today, we will either send uh, these people to uh, Homewood in Ontario or in the general population in the psych unit at the Health Science Centre. And both of these, while helpful, are not full recovery programs. You mentioned going out of the province there. How much better is it to be able to keep people here so they can get the treatment rather than having to go to Ontario? Well, eating disorders are a family issue. You know, the, the most misunderstood part of an eating disorder is the impact it has on a family. The family are absolutely devastated by this uh, situation, and most uh, eating disorders are handled on an outpatient basis. So they're home seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and the personality changes that occur for an eating disorder are quite, are quite, quite dramatic. So having the family uh, supports necessary, I think, uh, with this inpatient unit is absolutely necessary. Sending somebody to Hope, uh, a home, what I should say, in Ontario, uh, you don't have that kind of family support. So this is a family issue. Having it here will allow families to participate with their family member uh, along the path of recovery, which could take up to five to seven years. Your wife started the foundation after losing your daughter. How would a facility like this have helped Renata and her struggles with anorexia? Well, uh, back then, uh, 12 years ago, there was no formal treatment for eating disorders. You ended up in a general population on a ward, perhaps, uh, uh, with uh, people trying to look after your primary care responsibilities, but no recovery treatment. Uh, today, uh, you know, Renata would be alive today with this treatment program that's coming online. Uh, so there's great continuity. I think the press release referred to continuum of service. Many of the people who are in outpatient service today are the same people who require inpatient service. So we're going to have a good continuum of service across the Janeway program, which is inpatient outpatient, and across the outpatient inpatient over 18. So uh, there will be about 20 people working in those four programs. So today, I, I hesitate to say it, but I think uh, we'll, we'll reduce the loss of life, and if not eliminate the loss of life with these various programs. And so how does that holistic approach of many different professionals helping people and basically working together as a team change the outcomes for the people who are dealing with this disorder? Well, in, in many cases, uh, you know, there's two elements of an eating disorder. One, of course, is uh, those requiring inpatient service have a very serious deterioration in their primary care health. That's one aspect of it. And the other is that an eating disorder is a mental health addiction. So, uh, you know, the, the collaboration that's required across many disciplines within the healthcare system is currently working quite nicely for the programs that we have. And I think the, the press release mentioned an interdisciplinary team. So I'm very hopeful that uh, with 20 people totally dedicated to eating disorders, uh, we're very hopeful here that we've, we've done what has to be done to take care of each person who comes knocking on our door every day now, we have a placement for them. This is a huge success, and we want to say to the Minister of Health that this is badly needed, and despite all of the difficulties, financial difficulties that they're faced, uh, this will clearly save lives. Well, Vince Withers, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this opportunity, Peter. Well, in its 2017 budget, the provincial government announced $1.3 million would go to early learning and child care supplemental budget. Well, today, the Minister of Education, Dale Kirby, announced the details on how that'll take shape. Here now is Nakshit Pandit has more on what it means for early childhood educators. Taking care of these little people is hard work. And for years, child care workers have complained the pay is too low. Today, if you're an early childhood educator in Newfoundland and Labrador, expect a pay increase. 
Minister of Education Dale Kirby laid out the details this afternoon. For starters, ECEs who work for child care center operators can expect the highest increase. For child care center operators, uh, eligible full-time ECEs with levels uh, 2 to 4 certification will see an increase, again based on their level of certification, between 2500 and 3500 annually. Others who work for other types of child care spaces can also expect a heavier paycheck. For early childhood educators um, who are working in child care centers or family child care, uh, eligible full-time ECEs uh, with levels 1 to 4 certification will see uh, pay increases that are reflective of their certification and that will be between $2,840 and $5,340 uh, annually. Another change? ECEs with Family Child Care Agency home visitors will now be able to apply for the Early Learning and Child Care Supplement. The minister stressed his government's appreciation for the work ECEs across the province do. This announcement today really demonstrates uh, our commitment to ensuring that they're remunerated in a way that more closely reflects their training, their qualifications and what they contribute to uh, our children's development and their well-being in general. The announcement was received well by child care operators. I think it's amazing and that it's really a great step forward in improving the quality of our educators and definitely for recruitment because at times it can be a little challenging uh, through employee selection so it definitely will encourage more people to um, choose to be an early childhood educator. Now this is a promise kept for Premier Dwight Ball's government. The details revealed today aren't new. They were part of the most recent provincial budget. Nakshi Pandit, CBC News, St. John's. While well, police are looking to identify victims of a Deer Lake man who's been convicted of child luring and possessing child pornography. The 65-year-old targeted children online between November 2015 and June 2016. Police say his victims were between 10 and 15 years old and likely weren't aware that any crime was being committed. The man pretended to be a teenage boy and over email as well as Facebook, Instagram and Skype all under the profile name Amon Charlie Boy. Well, if you caught our show yesterday, you saw that Carolyn had a lot of fun down at yes. the lake. Uh, she got to feast on all those goodies mm -hmm. along with Dale Jarvis, but there was something that wasn't nearly so fun that happened. What happened? Yeah, yeah. So during my interview with Dale Jarvis, um, a guy came up behind us and said that well-known, very obscene phrase that we course can't say here but it goes by the acronym FHITP uh, and uh, we were rolling when it happened so we just thought we'd show you. So here we are doing the interview and uh, you can see the young man and they do look quite young coming up uh, behind us there that guy says the phrase and uh, it looks like his friend with the Blue Jay sweater is a uh, recording it on his phone. So lots of people around, you know, children. And I saw it happen in the moment, but uh, just ignored it and continued on. And just, you know, just can't believe this is actually still a thing. This has been going on for years and people have been fired from their jobs. There have been cases that have gone to court. People have been charged. And it's still happening to a lot of uh, my colleagues, and there can be some pretty serious consequences. Well, yes, yeah, right? Today in court, there was one man who's faced criminal charges because of an incident involving an NTV reporter yes. that we've reported on before. Um, so it is something that the police are taking seriously. Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of our colleagues are, are getting this, uh, men and women. Uh, we hear lots of stories about this. So, you know, we're showing this and, and they're young men, but I just hope that, you know, whoever this guy is, I hope your mom or your nan is watching and, uh, you know, recognizes them and uh, just tells them to maybe grow up a bit and get some manners. We're just all trying to do our jobs, right? Yeah, you're just out there trying to work, do a regular interview and mm -hmm. having 
vile things shouted out yeah. to you is not part of what you signed up for yeah. when you become a reporter. Absolutely. And it's not the sort of thing that people should be telling women in any environment, <laughs> working <laughs> or otherwise. Not. Yeah, so we actually uh, ended up, CBC uh, did file a complaint with the RNC, so a constable came by the studio uh, this afternoon and took a statement from me, so uh, yeah, we'll... So yeah, so if you do recognize those people, you can either call the RNC directly or uh, get in touch with us here at CBC and we'll pass that information yeah, along. You know, I could just let it slide, but I feel like you need to talk about it because this really, this kind of vulgar prank just really needs to stop, right? Absolutely. And as we... Well, after the break, more from Sid Hines, the executive chairman of OceanX, to hear what he thinks of the North Atlantic right whale crisis. We're in full festival Ooh. mood right across the province, uh, so a lot of people looking ahead to that weekend forecast. Folk Festival here in St. John's is a big one, and that's outside, so if yes. the weather is bad... <laughs> and the Busker Festival is starting tomorrow, too. Absolutely, and lots of other 
little festivals and events happening right across the province. So the weekend? Yeah, looking good. You're Excellent. in luck if you're heading out to the festival. Now, Saturday, much nicer than Sunday. Things are going to cloud over and we're looking at maybe some showers in the evening. I'll uh, get right to it. Actually, are we going to have a look at uh, St. John's right now? We just thought we'd punch this up. This is a live shot of St. John's Harbor. It's a lovely evening. It's a little bit cool, 15 degrees, but uh, not a lot of cloud in the sky there as you can see. So let's have a look at uh, the summary for the forecast to come. Uh, like I mentioned, there, there is some morning drizzle on the way for the south coast and for eastern parts of the province, but that should dissipate throughout the day. So we should have a nice Friday morning in those areas. Dandy Saturday coming for pretty much everyone. So if you're making any outdoor plans, Saturday is your day and there is a bit of a damp stretch that is uh, heading for Labrador. Here's a look at some of the highs today. Cooler on the Avalon Peninsula in the mid teens, uh, but nice and warm in central uh, in the mid 20s there as the high and some nice uh, temperatures as well in Labrador. Cartwright hit 23 today in Mary's Harbor 25. So things are going to stay pretty warm, which is great. Now you can see this band of uh, rain that's coming across Labrador about 5 to 15 millimeters expected there and a chance of thunder showers throughout the night tonight, but fairly clear on the island. Uh, we could see a little bit of drizzle there along the south coast tonight and into uh, tomorrow morning. So this is uh, how we're looking. You can see those thunder showers uh, in parts of Labrador, Cartwright, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, the low tonight, 12 degrees, cooler in Lab City, six degrees, and uh, on the island, some uh, drizzle overnight tonight and into the morning and lows of about 10 degrees in St. John's. So looking at your Friday heading in to the weekend, you can see those showers there looking nice and clear in Labrador. Not much cloud cover there at all. And uh, the island also looking really, really nice. But this is uh, some of the weather that is uh, on the way for Labrador. You can see that system that it will be moving through and bringing some more showers to Labrador. So here in St. John's, we're looking at an 11 degree start to the day with a chance of drizzle. But by the afternoon, it'll clear off nicely. We're looking at 19 degrees as the high, some nice light winds and cooling down a little bit in the evening, 17 degrees with some sun and cloud if you're heading out tomorrow night. So these are uh, the temperatures for the rest of the island. This is the drizzle that will be in the morning, but like I mentioned, a lot of that will clear off. 14 degrees tomorrow in Placentia, but it'll be much warmer as you head inland. So that's just the cooler temperatures along the coast. Clarenville, 24 degrees tomorrow with sun and cloud. Central looking fantastic. So 26 degrees in Gander, lots of sunshine. You can see everywhere. Bay Vert, 28 degrees, but you know, with that humidex, it's going to feel much, much much warmer. It'll feel more like 30 degrees in those areas tomorrow. Some drizzle along the coast here, but uh, much of western Newfoundland is looking great. 28 degrees in Humber Valley. Lots of sunshine. Just wonderful. Moving on up to the straits, some showers moving in, but uh, not too heavy. Uh, we're looking at 24 degrees uh, in St. Anthony tomorrow with a chance of showers there. Some sun and cloud in Cartwright with 19 degrees. For the rest of Labrador, enjoy Friday because it's going to be a great one. Lots of sunshine across the board. Temperatures in the low 20s. 23 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So I'll have more details on what you can expect on the weekend coming up. Thanks, Carolyn. As we told you earlier in the show, scientists are scratching their heads about the death of 10 North Atlantic right whales. The whales are already endangered, and some of the whales are being killed when they hit ships. Ocean X operates back and forth from Montreal through the area that's home to these whales. So what's the company doing to prevent collisions? Well, I met up with Sid Hines today to find out. So we've heard that a lot of these whale deaths are being caused by boat strikes. As someone who operates ships in this area, how concerned are you about these deaths of these right whales? Well, we're very concerned about it. It's quite unusual. Uh, from our perspective, uh, you know, ships have been trading in the Gulf for years, as you know. The numbers haven't gone up. Whales have been there for years, but we never heard of this before. So it's a new one on us as well, and uh, uh, we, we have no real explanation for it. Uh, you know, uh, something obviously has changed, but it is very unusual. And from our perspective, uh, we take the matter very seriously. 
and uh, obviously uh, keep keener lookout. You know, it's not something we want to be doing. And I'm sure no other ship does too. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, we have not been involved with any of these events. And uh, it's a real strange one. So what are the ships able to do in order to try and avoid these sorts of collisions with whales? Well, obviously a better lookout during daylight hours, you know, to be very keen uh, for the whales. And in addition to that, we've instructed our captains to uh, be running our dip sounding equipment continuously, which makes a lot of noise in the water. Hopefully we'll let it tip them off. You know, it's, uh, it's real strange because it's simple for a whale to get out of the way, they just dive. And you're talking 30 feet and there won't be an event, for example, in our case. And I guess the deepest ships that go into St. Lawrence are probably 50 feet, so it's still not a big issue. But for some reason, you're hearing more of this lately than before. So we're somewhat mystified by it. Uh, you know, we don't have an explanation. I guess we wait for the scientists to enlighten us, but uh, that's as much as we can do at this stage. Obviously, uh, if we have the opportunity to reduce speed where we can and maintain our schedule, we would in those particular areas, but that will have huge impacts if we have to do that, for example. Well, yeah, they've recommended that ships reduce their speeds down to 10 knots, I guess especially at night where it's harder to spot them. Um, have you been able to do that, and what sort of impact does that have on the schedule as you're talking about? Well, it, it, it will have a big impact on our schedule, and that will filter through the whole supply chain system. For example, um, 10 knots was recommended where possible. It's not mandatory by any means. But where it's possible, they suggest that 10 knots would give them a better chance to get out of the way. Uh, if we were to do that, and that's half speed, which is double the time, and a seven-day service would become something much longer. So uh, the impacts would be huge financially as well directly, uh, you know, because time is money. And if you can do a crossing in uh, 60 hours and it takes you 100 hours, it's going to be significantly different. Um, so there'll be impacts there, plus at the end of the day, the food chain just in time delivery is so well tuned. If we don't show up here Monday morning, chances are what you thought you were going to have Monday evening, you won't. It's that simple. It's very uh, tight situation. Uh, what other shipping companies I can't speak to, not everybody is into the, you know, if you're into bulk movements, there may be some slack, but either way, it's, uh, it doesn't come uh, without an impact. The other impact that they're talking about is moving the shipping lanes to create different routes that might take ships away from the whales. How big of an impact would that have on the schedules? Uh, I'm not sure that's so easy to do because based on the information that we have, it covers across the Gulf. So, uh, you know, there's no other way into the Gulf, only go through the Gulf. So uh, I don't quite understand that at this stage, how that would be possible. Uh, obviously, uh, some mitigations could may work, but uh, I don't think it's possible to go into the Gulf without going through the Gulf. Well, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with me. Thank you. So what do scientists know about these whale deaths? We'll hear more from them and from the minister coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Scientists are waist deep in whale carcasses, trying to figure out why so many endangered right whales have died. Here's a bit about what they know so far about what's killing the whales and some of the options for making sure it doesn't happen again. The pathologist examined thoroughly all the outside of, of these whales and before embarking on the, the, the further dissection of the insides. And, but they're looking for lesions, they're looking for cuts in the blubber, they're looking for um, signs of health as well to see if uh, the whale's health may have been compromised prior to any other uh, external factors. Uh, you know, it's, it's really a process of elimination when, when conducting necropsies to try to eliminate all the different possible uh, contributing factors that may have led to the death of the animal. And that's why it takes time for this an uh, necropsy an analysis to take place. The, uh, the pathologists that are doing this work uh, also rely heavily on the context of, of these deaths, so trying to understand con time of death, where the whale may have derived from, uh, and going forward, trying to put all these pieces of the puzzle together to assess what actually happened to these whales. And it's, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking. One, one necropsy alone is a huge endeavor. Uh, six is, is even, even more so. I'm not prepared to have a circumstance like the one we had this year repeat itself next year. And that's why I'm going to work with the industry, the fishing industry, that Mark Garno and I are going to work with the uh, marine transport industry, to ensure, for example, that the minimum amount of rope is floating on the surface. If you put your crab trap uh, in 200 feet of water, maybe you don't need 350 feet of rope uh, because 150 feet of that will be floating across the surface. I see that on my little motorboat when I leave the Cocan Cape Wharf next week when the lobster season starts. Uh, but in deeper water, like where I was this morning, um, where there, there are so many uh, right whales, uh, that represents a real threat. I learned from the scientists this morning that the right whales, uh, they eat uh, plankton. Uh, they don't eat fish, like the killer whales in British Columbia, like Chinook salmon. So these right whales open their mouths and literally go along the surface with this sort of mesh they have in their mouths, and that's how they filter out the plankton that floats on the water that nourishes them. They like the plankton that's fattier and more oily, if you're really interested, I learned about that. Um, but the problem is that's floating on the surface. So as that's floating on the surface, so too are the fishing ropes. Uh, and it's not clear when you look at the pictures uh, of the sort of mesh they have in their mouths, which are able to capture the plankton, that's how they feed, so too will it capture a piece of nylon rope. Uh, and it's not clear that, that that doesn't represent the beginning of a very difficult circumstance. So, those are all the kinds of things that we're going to have to work on with the industry. Like you said, the whales are really skimming the waters. So depending on the weather, the temperature, the, the wave actions and all that, they could be picked up by radar uh, or they could not be picked up by radar. So they're very difficult. Even like I said, Dominic, uh, the minister said today that even with the aircraft, sometimes they're hard to spot. So I would suspect on the water, because they're basically just skimming the water, they'd be very hard to detect uh, with radar on a, on a fishing vessel. It's basically mostly visual observation. Well, from problems with whales to problems with birds, a local scientist says your bird feeder is killing birds. We'll hear why after the break.
Now, it's called frounce, and it's killing songbirds on the island. It's a parasite that can be spread from bird to bird and by bird feeders. Here now is Glenn Payette spoke with Memorial University bird researcher Bill Montevecchi about the deadly disease. The parasite just keeps growing and growing and it generates this incredible cheesy mass that in fact actually ends up blocking the digestive, you know, pathways and, uh, you know, the breathing pathway, pathways. And so the birds just end up, when they get it, this horrible death, you'll, you'll see the birds around on the ground or on feeders and oftentimes just gaping their beaks. And it's, it's a terrible thing to watch. It's highly infectious. What birds get it? Yeah, mostly it's those birds that will go to seed eaters, you know, they'll go to your feeders. So, you know, American gold finches, purple finches, um, the gross beaks, uh, highly contagious for birds, not for us, not for dogs, not for cats. Um, potentially for, you know, a hawk or an owl that might take an infected bird, the parasite could go that way. And, and the, I guess the punchline is we don't need those feeders up now by any stretch of the imagination. Why don't we need those feeders? Well, there's lots of food. Um, our yard right now, we've got robins, uh, we've got finches around. It looks like it's gonna be a pretty good cone crop this year. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of food around. And even in the early fall, there's lots of food around. Uh, I think, well, and as a matter of fact, if you were feeding birds now, you'd actually be killing birds if this parasite comes in. So you'd actually be causing much more harm than we should have. You know, they, birds wouldn't normally be concentrated in a feeder like that. And what ultimately kills the bird? I think it's, uh, I, I think, I think the parasite just takes over and I, and I think that I, because that's what we see, you know, you see the bird, they can't eat anymore, you know, I don't think they can even ingest food. So there's this, you know, like choking to death or drowning is, and, and the birds look messy around their head and feathers because the, you know, that greasy substance just gets all over them. So I think it's just uh, starvation at the end of the day that they just can't get food and, and they can't get rid of the parasite. Every year, uh, par actually parasite or not parasite, um, really good idea to clean the feeders. Uh, this is one, this is a seed feeder, a big seed feeder that was up last year. You can see there's lots of junk in there. And it, you know, it can get all kinds of bacteria from the seeds. You know, it doesn't even have to be the frounce. It can be all kinds of junk. So these, these things get pretty dirty. And um, so good idea always to clean them out. And um, the recommended treatment for the parasite is 10% uh, bleach in water, which, which I have mixed here. And then, you know, just a matter of uh, really just going through that, cleaning them out and, uh, you know, just making sure they're, you know, the, so you can see all the, I mean, the bacteria and stuff, whatever it is, seed husks, you know, so it, it actually, and it's gonna take a bit of scrubbing, even on the outside. I mean, this is where a bird might actually, you know, because it's beaks going in there and you can see this, there's junk right on the wire parts of the uh, thing. And that, you know, so the parasite, if it's in the mouth and it's a sticky substance, it can just stick on there, next bird in, picks it up. And so it can be a problem, yeah. This is a suet feeder. Um, you know, you put, so this, this is the kind of feeder that'll get finches, but it'll also get woodpeckers, blue jays. And you can see from the, from the suet and from whatever, you know, from bird smearing it around, you know, so suet's sticky anyway. And then uh, if you, uh, on top of that, if you, you know, it's sticky anyway, but on top of that, and then you, if the bird had the parasite, and particularly now in the summer, uh, when it's warm, that's when the parasite can spread. So, so I, I'm cleaning them, but I'm putting them away. I mean, I actually took these, they, they weren't even up, but you know, but, but that's what people can do. And then, you know, think about late fall, winter to come back out with them, you know? So that's a precaution um, and it would be a precaution um, for any time, but it'll, certainly if there's any parasite, we'd get rid of it, hopefully, you know, with the bleach and the scrubbing. Well, and if you're wondering, if you come across a dead bird and you're wondering, maybe did it die of frounce, um, the good news is Montevecchi says it is safe to handle a bird that has died of the disease. So if you see one, he suggests turning it into the province's chief veterinary officer, Dr. Laura Rogers, so they can use it for research. Well, from birds to the great outdoors, camping season is in full swing, especially with the rather nice summer weather that we've had across much of the island. Some of us are pros at it, while others eh, need a little bit of guidance. Here are some helpful tips to make your trip one to remember. Marielle Tori Franenk has more. Looking to trade this city life for a lakeside view? Here are some things to remember. You'll need a park permit. 
That could mean booking well in advance. Pick a campsite you're comfortable with. Some have electricity and water, and some are near flush toilets and showers. If you're borrowing a tent, practice pitching it before you go. A yoga mat or foam tiles can help insulate you from the cold ground. As for what to wear, pack layers. Stay cool in active wear, insulate with a wool or fleece shirt, and stay dry in a waterproof jacket. But avoid cotton. When cotton gets wet, it absorbs and holds on to all that moisture. The rule of thumb for firewood is to buy it where you'll burn it. Many parks sell wood on site to avoid bringing in invasive species. As for food, plan your meals. That way, you'll know what kitchen materials to bring. And keep food away from wildlife by securely storing it, or by hanging it at least four meters up in a tree. Bringing alcohol? Rules say to keep it in your campsite and off beaches and trails. If you are hiking for the day, a sturdy 20-liter backpack will do. And pack it with the essentials. Consider a hands-free headlamp, at least two liters of water, a whistle, flare, or GPS in case you get lost, and a portable charger for your device so you won't miss capturing a single moment. Marielle Tori Franca, CBC News. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Carolyn, it's been a bit of a depressing show, all in all, between the whales and the birds and... More animals. I, and so before we get to the weather, mm -hmm. want to have a little bit of a video to try and do maybe a bit of a pick-me-up. Have a yes. look. Yeah, a, a little while, you may remember this, we brought you the story of a paradise couple who adopted a little boy from an orphanage in Kazakhstan. A little boy was born with one hand, and so was his new grandfather. Yeah, it's an amazing story for sure, one that we've told you about uh, here on the show in the past, and it was also recently captured by the St. John's Airport as part of their Celebrating Hi. 75 Years campaign. <laughs> hey, hey. That was you and me playing yep. at the airport. Right here. That's a wreck, folks. Hey. <laughs> So sweet. Adorable to see that, uh, the two of them again. Yeah. Well, let's get to the weather, shall we? Because uh, long range, very important. We're looking at the weekend. Uh, we'll start with some temperatures for tomorrow. A little bit of drizzly weather coming for the east and along the south to start for tomorrow morning. But we're going to be heading up to about 19 degrees uh, on the Avalon, cooler along the coast. So things will clear off nicely as the day goes on. A nice hot day in central parts of the island. 26 degrees as the high in Grand Falls, Windsor. Lots of sunshine right up along uh, the northern peninsula. Chance of showers in St. Anthony and uh, 24 degrees as the high there in Labrador. Tomorrow is going to be a great day, so if you can get out and enjoy it, this will be a wonderful day. We're looking at temperatures in the low to uh, mid 20s uh, for much of Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay going up to 23 degrees tomorrow with some sunshine. So let's look at the weekend. This is Friday night. You can see some showers coming in through Labrador, but things are looking quite nice on the island. Some drizzle down here and some cloud cover, but uh, as we get into Saturday, things are just wonderful. You can see nice and clear, so pretty much sunshine across the board. A bit of cloud uh, on Saturday. 21 degrees as the high in St. John's. 26 degrees in Grand Falls, Windsor. Corner Brook, 27. So and the winds will be nice and light. If you're going to be taking part in the food fishery, Saturday will be a great day to head out on the water. But in Labrador, there are a few showers. Uh, there in Lab City, 22 degrees. Cooler along the coast, 13 in Nain with some showers as well, but still looking good and cart right there some sun and cloud and 26 degrees on Saturday so for Sunday uh, things will start to cloud over a little bit on the island and some more showers uh, coming up through Labrador you can see this system is going to keep things kind of damp in Labrador for a while so looking at Sunday uh, this system could affect the west and uh, parts of central, so you could get some showers on Sunday. Temperatures still nice and warm, though, in the 20s. 
We may avoid some of the, the wet weather here in the east, but it should cloud over quite a bit on Sunday and then Sunday night. We may start to see some of those showers and in Labrador as well. Lots of showers happening there. 17 degrees in Lab City on Sunday, but still nice and warm in Happy Valley. Goose Bay 23 degrees with some showers expected there. So you can see this week, midweek, things were so cool, but now things are starting to warm up quite nicely. We're every every day we're in the 20s, so a little bit of rain scattered in here and there, but that is just, you know, good for the plants, right? So we have lots of sunshine to look forward to as well. This is the, the damp spell that I had been talking about with a Labrador in the east on Sunday. Those showers continuing into Monday and Tuesday, so hopefully things will start to clear off midweek, but still some nice warm temperatures there. And western Labrador, a little bit damp there. You'll have a bit of, of a dip in the temperatures on Monday. Monday, but hopefully things will start to warm up as the week goes on. Peter. Well, time now to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Lillian Tobin from CBS. Lillian is eight years old and a member of the St. John's Lollipop Beginner Synchro Team. Yes, Lillian also skates and loves swimming and soccer. Great work, Lillian. You are our young athlete of the day. <laughs> Well, it's Despacito, the international hit from Louis Fonzi and Daddy Yankee. There's also a popular remix featuring Justin Bieber, but these Croatian guys who call themselves two cellos, for very obvious reasons there, uh, made their very own version. The original song has over two billion views on YouTube, so you likely won't get this tune out of your head for a little while. We'll leave this for you as we head to commercial. Welcome back to Here and Now. The much-anticipated showdown, showdown rather, between Usain Bolt and Canadian Andre de Grasse. 
is not going to happen this weekend. A hamstring injury is forcing DeGrasse to pull out of the World Track and Field Championship in London. The CBC's Thomas Daigle has the latest from London Stadium. In a hotel room somewhere in London right now, Andre DeGrasse is said to be on his cell phone playing video games, doing anything to keep his mind off this place, London's Olympic Stadium, where he should be getting ready for Saturday's big 100 meter final showdown against Usain Bolt. That is not going to happen now that uh, DeGrasse is out with a hamstring injury from Monday, just announced uh, late last night. Now, according to uh, DeGrasse is a coach, Stu McMillan, who spoke with us today. Yes, DeGrasse is disappointed, but he called this just a blip in his career. Uh, DeGrasse is 22 years old. He's going to bounce back from this. And uh, McMillan basically saying that this rivalry between Bolt and DeGrasse was much more important to viewers, to the media, than it was to DeGrasse himself. Here's what coach Stu McMillan told us. There's absolutely zero disrespect from Andre to, to Usain. He's got nothing but respect for him. Clint, you know, Usain Bolt's the, the best athlete that's probably ever lived, and, and Andre will, will be the first to admit that. Nick Mellon says DeGrasse will be returning to Canada in the coming days, but in the meantime, he's still here in London. He's going to be attending a soccer match in the coming days, probably going to be watching that 100-meter final uh, on Saturday on television, and McMillan says that's when it might hit DeGrasse. He might be even more sad than he is already knowing that he should have been one of the men on the track on Saturday. What this does do, though, is it makes it more likely that this is going to be a coronation. One last high note for Usain Bolt in his career before he uh, retires from the track here in the same spot where Bolt won three gold medals back uh, in 2012 at the London Olympics. It is another chapter in the Bolt DeGrasse rivalry that DeGrasse now just seems to be playing down. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. And if you're a fan of the World Track and Field Championships, we've got some good news for you. CBC is broadcasting them. They begin tomorrow. So the bad news is that tomorrow night's Here and Now is only going to be a half-hour show. Uh, it's going to run from 6.30 to 7 o'clock. So you'll uh, catch the track and field stuff between 6 and 6.30, and then we'll be on the air at 6.30. Well, in other news, Canada's priority in dealing with the rising tide of asylum seekers pouring across the Quebec border is the security of Canadians. But Ottawa recognizes not all applicants will stay in Quebec. Quickly to implement a number of measures in response to the spike in asylum claimants in Quebec. And these include triaging claimants to identify those who intend to go elsewhere in Canada. Those claims will be processed in the various offices across the country as quickly as possible and closest to where the claimants hope to reside. Mark Miller says all the claimants will undergo security screening. That means criminal background checks and health status checks. Well, looking at the issue of drugs now, opioid abuse and fentanyl overdose deaths are now a nationwide reality. In Toronto, the mayor convened an emergency meeting in response to six suspected drug-related deaths and 20 overdoses in less than a week. I don't think there's any magic answer to this, and there's lots of people out there. I'm seeing emails and so on saying, you know, tell people to stop taking drugs. Well, in an ideal world, people wouldn't abuse alcohol or take drugs or, or have mental illness issues. But the bottom line is that people do. They're human beings. And so our obligation is to do whatever we can to speed up or change uh, what we're doing to save lives. The mayor says talks are underway about the speeding up of a fall launch of three new safe injection sites in Toronto. Well, the two largest wildfires burning in British Columbia have led to new evacuations. One of the evacuation orders, prompted by the Elephant Hill fire burning near Clinton, now extends southwest of the village. Officials say a controlled burn there quickly got out of hand. About 100 properties are affected. Fire crews across the province are bracing for an extraordinarily hot stretch of weather. Just what they don't need, which could be followed by lightning over the weekend. Well, there was quite the scene in New York's Central Park today. State officials and the Wildlife Conservation Society crushed a ton of confiscated ivory to raise awareness about the plight of elephants. The ivory was in the form of trinkets, statues, jewelry and tusks. In all, there were more than 650 pieces valued at about $6 million. The items were seized by New York's Department of Environment and Conservation.
Welcome back to the show. A 10-year-old who has spina bifida isn't letting anything hold him back when it comes to pulling over-the-top stunts in his wheelchair, quite literally. Wow, that is uh, quite the feat. An Oregon-based nonprofit is getting the boy a uniform to match his skills. They've built him a special costume and wheelchair modeled after The Flash. A professional team behind the design donated their time and money to create the look. And naturally, Aww. The Flash is getting a lot of attention, both on the streets and beyond. But only if they can catch him. <laughs> look at oh, that. Wow. That's awesome. That is, that is pretty impressive. And even the Flash has a seatbelt there. You know, you gotta have <laughs> safety first, even if you are the Flash. And it lights up, it is so elaborate. That is just great. Well, another thing that is just great is Saturday. So let's have a look at the next three days and you can see here that the day to enjoy the weather is Saturday. Looking great on the island. Things clouding over on Sunday and some showers moving in there, but temperatures nice and warm. It's going to be that the weather in Labrador Saturday uh, looking wet in Western Labrador with a high of 22 degrees, but uh, Cloudy and uh, quite warm in uh, the eastern parts of Labrador. So let's have a look at our weather picture of the day. Isn't this great? Oh, beautiful. That looks tasty. Yes. Nice day on cod. <laughs> this is uh, Bernice Gowdy in Port Rexton. Uh, thank you so much for sending that to us. Just great. And thanks so much, all of you, for watching. Have a great night. Good night.